Welcome, Misty, to our best possible future. I am so excited to have a chat with you because you have some fresh wisdom. It was funny the other day we spoke for a few hours, I think, but uh... <laughs> probably way longer than we thought. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yes, you're in Queensland. I'm in Sydney. We're going to have a great little chat this Thursday afternoon. Um, I love to start off, Misty, with the question. How do you feel we can co-create our best possible future? <laughs> I believe, <laughs> I've learned how to, how to absorb that question, but uh, for the best possible future, I actually believe that everybody should have, should have the wisdom, the knowledge or the wisdom on how to earn their own money. I mean, it's easy, could be considered easy enough by some or hard enough by others, to turn around and get a job, but it is easy enough to get paid by others if you're employed, right? But you're only going to get paid according to what it is that they choose to give you. And, um, and you know, I've learned growing up that, like, I thought that if you if you turn up every day and you're loyal and you do your job, that you're worth more money. It turns out you, you even if you're worth it, they can't give it to you unless more cash has come into the place in the first place. So all you can earn is based off how much they've brought in personally, so how much they can they can divvy out to everybody else. Whereas if you have the knowledge on how to earn your own money, you can still be in a job and choose to earn extra in some other way or have the knowledge to know how to up your pay inside any particular work. And if I just give you a quick example, I mean, if I was an apprentice hairdresser where I'm earning, I don't know, $7 an hour or $10 an hour, right, and I can't even cut here, versus a senior hairdresser that can do all the styles in the world, who becomes more valuable? The, the, the junior hairdresser who can't even do the job yet, but brings in all her friends and family members into the hairdressers to get their hair done there, versus the senior hairdresser who can do all the work, but brings in no one. Mm. And the person who brings in the, the clients is the one that's worth more money than the one who doesn't and just does the job. So if you know how to bring in your own money, you can either do it in a job by bringing in clients or you can do it yourself some other way. And there's ups and downs along the way, but ultimately learning the knowledge on how to bring in your own money means you can choose to use that knowledge or not, but you just store it for when you need it. It's very powerful. I love your... Um fresh approach to sales because I have done many sales trainings over the years and we're all selling whether we think we are or not so it's something that's a as a human it's worth getting be, becoming more mas masterful in um and <laughs> it's what, so true right <laughs> what 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 is what is it like the brief kind of overview of how you got to be focused on this and doing amazing sales trainings and helping people make their own money Okay, so um, from oh, a very early age, yeah, from a very early age, a quick overview is that I fell in love with money probably from the first day that I saw it. I think most of us do. We just know it's shiny and it buys chocolates, so you know. Um, so I've just always liked money and liked the idea of if I could earn my own, I could buy my own chocolate because uh, we didn't have much money growing up. So there's only so much you could you would get at um, at doing groceries and things like that. Like help me you know, when mom's doing the groceries and it would run out pretty fast, but chocolate's delicious. So, you know, we all want that. But along the way um, on how I ended up on this sales thing, I was a barmaid um, for a number of reasons, but one from 18 to 27, I was a barmaid for the purpose of, I liked the idea of I'd get paid, but I could earn tips. So I could get paid more than what I was actually paid. And I've gone, I really like that idea. I can earn extra. Now in Australia at the time, so going back, what? 20, 20, 25, nearly 30 years ago, I'm 46 now. So nearly 30 years ago, I mean, you didn't really get tips. I mean, now, I mean, you kind of get tips, but it's done as a big jar and I don't even know how it's given out. But uh, in Australia, we don't so much get tips. I just like the idea of being able to do it. And the few times I did get tips, I'd get so embarrassed that someone left money behind and gone, you've left your money. Um, so then I'd give it back. But if I was in America, um, like I've been to America and I've been to Canada and I would pay attention to how they served you to giving tips and I would sit there and think you know you do a good job but you know what 
I can do better than that. I would earn so much money and it's all based off, you know, little things like, you know, in a, in a restaurant, you don't earn extra money because you serve them the steak that they asked for. You earn extra money because you reminded them that they should save room for desserts because the chef made the most amazing chocolate pudding ever. <laughs> That's how you make extra money because it's it's the additional information that you give. And even if someone sits there and says, oh, no, I don't really eat dessert, that's okay. You should grab a piece to take home, have it with a cup of tea when you're at home, watch a movie. And then people are like, well, I feel like I should do that. And, you know, the chocolate cake isn't wrong because it's so delicious or, you know, the bacon, uh, the, the pecan pie or whatever it is, you know, sticky date pudding. It's all great to have um but later, not when you're, you know, full immediately after dinner. So there's little ways and, you know, start with garlic bread while you're thinking. Never let the drinks run out. And it's so easy. Just never let the drinks run out. It's up to the table to say, stop giving us drinks. They'll look at the bill later and go, $500? <laughs> but you know what? I never had to call for a drink. So, you know, there's little ways to help out. And it's the never having to call someone over is what you get paid extra for, not for the fact that you sold, you know, $500 worth of drinks. So from a barmaid, I worked um, at Fantastic Furniture. So here in Australia, that's the um, the everyday furniture. I worked for Apple Computers. I also worked for um, uh, in the Patent and Trademark Office in the call centre with um, uh, selling paint and trademark applications, right? All of my jobs, what I teach in sales, the main way I teach sales, which is why you say it's so different to everything else, is I know the traditional sales training. I know how to do add-on sales. I learned it all through trial and error. How to sell the most to the people that walk in store. How to sell most the most to the people who walk into the pub, you know, so anywhere it is. So I know how to do that. The secret when someone walks in is to sell the most that you can because you don't know if they're ever coming back. But later in life, I've discovered um, that there's another way too. get them to walk in the door. You know, it's so easy to say to somebody, hey, I'm working over at the, the pub tonight. You should come over for dinner. And they're either going to come or they're not. But if they didn't know you were working there, well, they didn't know to come. So, you know, when do people choose to come? They can get the idea as well. But all of these jobs that I've done, every single one of these jobs, none of them could be discounted. Think of food and drink out at a restaurant or at a pub or a bar is the price is the price. I can turn up to a restaurant with nine mates. So there's 10 of us. We can all order exactly the same meal, steak, chips, and wine, let's say, right? So 10 meals, which is technically of exactly the same, which is technically buying in bulk. How much of a discount do we get when the bill comes through? Zero. We bought 10 steaks with chips and wine, but even though it's bulk and it's the same thing, it should have been easy for them to cook. There is no discount there. Then I worked for um, Fantastic Furniture. It's the base model. It's the everyday furniture in Australia. It comes at a package price. It's already priced. That's the price, no discounting. Uh, Apple computers. Apple says you can charge whatever you like for the computers. If you charge less than us, the store will make no profit. If you charge more than us, they will buy from us online because we ship for free. So... The price for Apple products the world over is exactly the same. Exchange rate, you know, but, I mean, it's exactly the same the world over. That's how they have it set up. And while customers complain, I don't want to spend that much, they do it every day. In their patents and trademark office, if you buy one trademark, this is going back, but if you buy one trademark um, it's for 10 years, it started at $420. If you buy 10 trademarks, it's $420 per piece didn't matter how many that you bought. So each one was one at, itself, one at a time. So all these things have gone, well, I had the knowledge of people would complain a lot, but they'd buy it anyway. And then the other side of it is I've done the grocery shopping with my mum since I was seven years old. She got a neck injury when I was seven. So she could walk and she could drive, but she couldn't push a trolley. She couldn't lift bags. She couldn't lift things and put them in and out of a trolley. She could carry a handbag. Actually, most days she couldn't even carry a handbag. It was too heavy. Wow. So as a result, I had to do all of that from seven. And she picked me because I loved maths. And so I had to add everything up. She wasn't allowed to be financially embarrassed when we got to the counter. And um, I was the quieter one between my sisters who, because we knew, I knew how much money we had to buy stuff because I had to add it up every week, I wouldn't ask 
for extra things off the grocery list. So I wouldn't ask for, for as much as I love chocolate. I wouldn't ask for the chocolates while we were shopping because I knew how much money we had. So what's interesting is doing the groceries from the age of seven, and even now I still love going to the grocery store, is um, I complain about, I go in to buy one thing, milk. I come out with a bag of stuff. It's probably four things. A bag of stuff, $50. Well, I suppose I'm spending that because I'm not giving it back. I'm embarrassed <laughs> that I'm over shop, you know. Like you just leave with it and you don't get a discount and you don't, you don't give it back. You're not really objecting. You're just like, well, that's, we'll just have to deal with that. So all of my training around price and selling is that the price is the price. And all we have to do is learn how to deliver the price to people, the audience, the, the consumers out there or the customers that come to us. If we, can, if we can deliver the price, when we learn to deliver the price without sounding anxious, without, uh, and you're not allowed to discount because we don't, we have evidence to say that you don't have to discount and things still buy. So that's what I teach, how to just say it simply and then be quiet so the customer can think decide which card they're going to use and choose to buy. I mean, the secret source is stop talking. <laughs> As salesmen, once they've said the price, you're not allowed to speak again. So that's my background. That's very cool. And I've actually included in the description a whole bunch of stuff that you share on your email because you're very upfront about this is the price. This is, And it's it's kind of, um, it's a, a really unique well, I'm sure there's other people doing it too. I just haven't seen it there's as a common thing. <laughs> <laughs> I can honestly tell you yeah. there is now. Yeah. I mean, now that you're training them. For me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I train hundreds of people on this every year. So I have yeah. um, I have two sales books, um, Deb. So I've got my first one, Overcoming Obscurity. So how to get noticed in the marketplace and make more money. So important is saying what you do and giving your contact details. In your signature block, in your email, it's chapter two in the book, right? That's how important it is. If you don't say what you do in all of your signature blocks on email, so on your phone, on your iPad, on your whatever other tablets and computers and things like that, then how is anyone going to know who you are and what they could possibly buy from you, like what you do, right? But in my second book, which um, I published last year, How to Go From No Sales to Sales, in chapter two, ironically, is a signature blog. I've brought it up again, but I've now called what I call a sales signature blog. So an original signature blog really is, um, your name, maybe a business name, what you do. So for me, business name would be Misty Henkel, sales trainer. What I do, sales trainer is in there, speaker, author, like that's in there, phone number, email address. Like with the absolute basics, that needs to be there. So if someone reads it goes, who is this person? Oh, they're a sales trainer, right? That says a lot all by itself. It says a lot. But a sales signature block now has, um, you know, like things that I sell. So I've got group sales classes, cost. $150 for six months. Link, you could literally click it and buy. The next thing is, you know, personal coaching sessions. Cost, $25 a session. Link, click it, buy. You know, sales book, how to go from no sales to sales. Cost, $30. Link, click and buy. And it's amazing how, and then right at the very bottom, because we discussed this the other day, right at the very bottom, I've got like, you know, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, email address, uh, website, sorry, website. And there's an order of which people look to buy things. First off, it's like, who is that person? Will they easily give me contact details if I want to call? If the answer is yes, great. So if I don't have to call, if they don't have to call, they, they, they won't. But I mean, if they want to buy something, they could call. The next thing is with that sales stuff is to put the thing that you buy up to four things of your most favorite things or the things you want to sell the most. If you put that next, they'll read down and go, I don't need to call. I could just press it and you can end up there. And the very last part, which is where people do it all wrong in a signature block, is the very last part you have to put is, is your um, like website and Facebook and that. People put that really high up the top, like as if you need to research me more before you make a solid decision because clearly you the consumer doesn't really know anything that is the interesting. thing I've ever heard. well Which interesting because i had i had that like those things first because it was more about connecting on socials first but yeah. i think that that's still actually putting a barrier into blocking a sale yes. sooner so what i like about what you're saying is just put everything really up front really easy to buy 
and easy to contact you if they want to um and it's really it's a really cool way to play with it so tell me like i was gonna say can i just touch on that for a second right the connection you thought oh well if i put it up the top they can connect with me more right so it's the no like and trust right Here's what's interesting. If they're reading anything about you, they already know, like, and trust you. They don't actually have to connect with you personally any more than they've already done it if they feel that they've done it. It's only if they feel that they need more connection or more understanding. We as a salesman, see, we're on the back foot. People can Google us all day long. We think it's not them that have to connect with us. We feel the need to connect with the client. Here's a hot tip. Assume that you're already friends. Yes, you have no idea who they are when they call you up, but since they picked you out of the crowd of everyone else, assume they've chosen you to be one of their confidants, one of their best friends. And see, we salesmen now do the traditional, let me ask you some questions so I can see where you're up to type thing. That was pre-Google. As a salesman, you could do all that. And the customer's like, yes, of course, you'll need to know. Today, because the customer has done all the research and they haven't just wandered into a place and found the closest salesman, they've literally picked us out of the crowd, which means that we're on the back foot. We don't have rapport with them because we don't know them, so we don't have a relationship. But they've already picked it with us. If we start to ask questions or go in a way that helps us build the relationship with them, like as in build the relationship as in I'd like you to like me, they already have. And if we go down that line, it's like, oh, clearly you don't know who I am after all. Oh, that's sad. Oh, well, I'll go find someone else. So we'll break the rapport. So our job really is to maintain the relationship that they've already chosen and just stick with them and go, of course they found me. I mean, I've gone to all this trouble to be noticed. Of course they've picked me out of the crowd. I'm a great person. I'm really good at what I do. I will stick with them and act like I know what they're talking about and it doesn't take long to understand what the customer's talking about anyway so we don't need to ask questions so yeah leave all the advertising stuff right down the bottom yeah really need well I think it. that I hadn't really seen social media as act as advertising but yeah I see what you mean and interestingly I've never really put my phone in email because one I don't really like to answer my phone unless I know the number and also I'm often on calls and not able to answer it um and email I'm not really a fan of email but I think that the the the, the message I'm getting is well it's time to actually embrace those modalities because they're the really great ways off. to right. Yeah. yeah, the phone number is us. But here's what I know. I put my phone number everywhere. Do you know how many people call me? Probably not like, many. No one. <laughs> it's so rare. And I, my email is probably, like my phone number, I'm in many, you know, Zoom things. So like it's in every Zoom box. I send out more than 200 emails a week, catching up with people, moving them from place to place, like, you know, sending out um, chat boxes from different events that I'm running, all sorts of things. Now, that's like 10,000 emails a year. I don't get really any phone calls. It's so rare. So on the off chance that someone is going to call, it's like you have the choice to answer or not. And then they generally leave a message and it's usually text messages. I tried to call you, but, and then you've got all the answers anyway. I mean, rarely does someone, is there not some sort of message that's left? And you can guarantee the person that doesn't leave a message, it's, it's not actually someone on the other side. Anyway, it's um, it's one of those weird phone calls with pictures. I wish I hadn't picked that up. So you can choose to just not go back to it at all. Email address, that's a harder one, right? So it's a fantastic way for you to get noticed through your email. But of course, you have to embrace the fact that um, you might have 85,000 unopened emails and you're going to have to do something about it. I'll tell you the secret to that. <clears throat> just delete them all and start again. I mean, if you're not looking at any of it, what does it matter if the two emails that are in there were so great, you've kept them for five years, but you can't, you know, how do you find them? Just delete everything, start again. It'll make you want to vomit at the very beginning. Once you press that button, it's like, there's literally nothing more I can do about it. <laughs> I've done it by accident before. I've done it on purpose before. It makes you feel sick every time, but then it's done. And it's like a whole new identity and your emails stay very low. <laughs> Good point. Really you learn to do better. <laughs> yeah. 
So tell me, uh, we were going to talk about how to talk about our pricing. Mm. And I know you have some hot tips on that. What would you say? Is All right. So <laughs> it was interesting. I was talking to something yesterday. Um, I was, yeah, I was in a group yesterday and the question became, how do you get confident? Like, how do you become confident or confidence in being able to talk about your price is so hard to do. Here's how you become confident. You practice saying it every day. So there's two sections to it. Practice saying your price every day. And the second one is practice saying it in front of people and have them have a reaction to your price. So let's use you as an example, right? Yeah. Actually, let's go back just a little bit. Now, the reason it's all about practice is just think this. You can't get good at playing the piano by just looking at it each day and looking at the music and then hoping the rest will happen, right? You've got to practice. And at the beginning, you're going to be really bad. And it's going to take a very long time for you to get into the habit of your fingers, get in the habit of knowing where it is. I've been uh, learning two, two bits on the piano. So parts of the Caribbean, which I've been practicing most days with one little section, most days I've I wrote it off the internet and, you know, I know all the letters and like the, the notes and things and I can do it with two hands very slowly. Some days are slightly better than others. It's starting to speed up a little bit. Can I do it without the music? No, not yet. Maybe with one hand, but not two together. Um, can I do it without looking at the, I can look at the notes and I can, I look a little bit down when I do it, but it's not got to the point of like typing, touch typing. And so, and I've been practicing this over and over for months, probably nearly a year, and um, and I'm getting better, but I'm not great. Having said that, I don't practice 10 hours every day, right? So, or every day, even just for 30 minutes. So I would improve a lot more. So you can't get good without practice. So let's practice here, right? I'm going to say, how much does it cost for, let's say, coaching? You pick any one of your prices, and when I say someone has to have a reaction, I'm just going to have a reaction and you get to sit there. And at the end, I want your reaction to my action be, I know, crazy, is it? isn't it? That's it. That's all I want you to say. Okay. Right? And we're going to practice this a few different times, a few times, but I'm going to say something different each time. Right. Okay. So, Deb, I hear you do coaching. So how much does it cost for coaching? $4,000. Four thousand dollars? What are you joking? How do you even sell that? I know, crazy, isn't it? Yeah, right. All right. Well, <laughs> let me have something to think about. Right. See, you put it all back on them to have a think. Right. All right. Let's go again. Deb, how much does it cost for coaching? Four thousand dollars. Four thousand dollars. Wow, you're so much cheaper than everyone else. How do you do it so cheap? I mean, you know, like, do you not value what it is that you do? crazy isn't it yeah see how the answer is exactly the same right so it doesn't matter what our price is someone's always going to have some sort of adverse reaction it doesn't matter if that some but one person considers it too high someone else will consider it too low someone else will say oh thank god you can i can finally get some help it doesn't really matter what our price is each time the comment here's what i want the listeners to take home is it's a comment that's made by someone it is not an objection it's just a comment right more often than not that comment is some sort of complaint i don't want to spend that i don't have any money i could never pay for that i would never pay for that it's technically a complaint but more than anything it's just a comment an objection is i'm not buying that and then they walk away but most people don't object. They complain and they comment, but they don't get up and walk out straight away. And we salesmen take that as, oh, my God, I need to do something about that. Now, here's what's interesting. If you turn around, if, if I ask you how much is it, $4,000, and you say $4,000 and I say, oh, my God, how can you even get away with those prices? That's outrageous. I would never spend that. Now, if you take that as an objection, here's what your next answer will be. We'll see the reason it's $400, $4,000 or whatever it is, right? The moment you start to give me a reason, you've treated my comment as an objection. 
And the moment you treat it as an objection, and now I have a reason to object, I don't have to buy it. But if you treat it as just a comment, I know, isn't it crazy? Brains, right? I mean, coaching is just about using your brain, and yet these things cost so much money to run. It's crazy, isn't it? And then it's just like for that other person to, go, to interpret what does that mean to me? It does. They cost so much money and I can't seem to overcome my brain. I need help. All right? So it's left for the person making the comment to make their final decision, not based off being uh, second-guessed. Traditional sales training would teach us to overcome objections, which technically don't actually exist. It was just a comment. And to give features and benefits and reasons because that will help the customer buy. But the truth is, is we've never needed help to buy. Things have always been bought at the price that's available, um, whether we like it or not. Groceries teach us this every day. Here's how groceries sell themselves to us, Deb. They sit on a shelf silently with their price. And we buy a lot of it. <laughs> you know what's really interesting the things that are hard to buy are the ones that sit on a shelf and the price fell off. How much is that? Mm. I don't know if you've ever gone shopping. At, I'm going to pick Woolworths because that's one of my local stores here. Coles is probably exactly the same. But it would appear to be that the things that you can buy in bulk, like, um, you know, uh, 24 bottles of water or dog food that's in bulk in eight kilos right on the bottom shelf, the bottom shelf never seems to come with a price. So you sit there going, well, I don't have to buy it. I'm just a little curious. I just like to know how much it is. And I know I'm not deviating from the brand that, you know, the pup likes. So I've got to go two golden retrievers. So I'm not going to deviate from the brand that they like. And I'm always going to get that one and technically in bulk, it's going to be less than a small packet. So I know it's less than, you know, like I know in general what it's going to be, but it'd just be nice if you just put a price up there and made it so that it stayed there. And it's really annoying. And and what happens is, as a shopper, I hate the store for not doing their job properly, even though I was going to buy it anyway. And I don't really care for what the price mm. is. I just hate that they're not doing their job properly. And so as salesmen of any product and service, our job that the customer wants done properly is tell us what it is and how much it is so I can make a decision or which bank account I'm going to use, or when I'm going to buy it, or so I can make a decision. But I can't make a decision easily if I have no idea of price. Yeah, it's interesting. I like what you say um, to really not take comments as necessarily objections and um, to be really comfortable in our pricing. When I gave you the price of 4000 even though we offer other options, is it better to just pick one price or say it ranges from 3000 to 8000 or you can never start what? in price how much is it for coaching you could you could have said from $4000 mm -hmm. and i'm going to have the same reaction yeah anyway you could have said $8000 you could have said $12000 $12000 my god how yeah. long does that go for see i'll have questions as a consumer $12,000, how long does that go for? You get to say, pretend it's, you, you've got that. That we do, we do actually. Have, so this is the other question of right. like, because well, I'm telling you in a USD, so we've got a package that's 8,000, which is equivalent of 12,000 Australian. So, um, yeah. Let's say 12,000, right? So, yeah. My next question, if you say 12,000 and say, how much is it for coaching? And you've decided the best one, the one that people buy the most, the one that gives the most that the client should be buying first up, mm -hmm. right? I have things that I believe that people should buy first up. I believe they should join group sales classes first. Coaching sessions are great. Hey, for a one-off, let's do an elevator pitch or fix a little bit, tweak something in there. But group sales classes is where all the magic is because you practice saying your product, your price, little things. You practice saying things. And from there you go, oh, I know where I need a sales, like a personal coaching session to fix that bit, or I'll hear it and I'll go, you know what, you need some extra help outside of class, right? 
So a one-off at the beginning is good because I can find out what it is that you do and, and fix something straight up. But the group coaching, the group classes is where I think everybody should head first, right? So that being the case, and it happens to be my most expensive thing, right? If you believe that the 8,000 US or 12,000 package is really the best one for coaches to improve the most because your history of what you've seen is the majority of people end up doing the $12,000 one. They might come in at the four or which whatever it is, Australian quick. So let's go from four and eight with being your American prices. They might come in at four, but most of them end up upgrading to the eight because that's, they work out, that's actually the better one for them. So if someone says, how much does it cost? Well, they've not asked the great question because yeah. they've just asked you to pick a price, right? Hmm. How much does it cost to do the groceries at Woolworths? From $2.50 would be my answer, right? <laughs> $2.50, what are you picking? A block of chocolate that's half priced currently at the moment at Woolworths. Like now, because notice that the customer will now have the second question based off whatever price I give. Oh, no, I meant like all the groceries, not a block of chocolate. <laughs> oh, to me, that is all the groceries. Yeah. <laughs> right? I might turn around and say $36. $36? What are you picking? 18 blocks of chocolate, half price, something on it, always. You know? Oh, my God, that's not groceries to me. So it's a bad question, but it allows the other person to go, oh, well, clearly I wasn't specific enough. So mm. if someone says, how much is it? You can say $8,000. Right, what is that? Coaching sessions, how long does that go for? 12 months worth, and I'm just picking numbers, right? Let's say it was 12 months worth. I don't think I need 12 months worth of coaching. Okay, what do you need? Well, I've done this, 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 and this, and I only really need a, a bit of help with tweaking a couple of things. I'm thinking I need like two individual sessions. Right. See, they're going to point you in a direction of what they wanted once you answer very simply any of their basic questions. because They've got an idea in their head. To them, they didn't know they didn't ask for, what's two individual coaching sessions? Do you do it? Can I get it done this week? They don't know they didn't ask that. Mm. They've just said, how much is it for coaching? And when you pick anything, they're not leaving you straight away. They're trying to work out, what does that mean? $8,000, is that for one session? No. <laughs> yeah. What's that for? <laughs> in, the, in the future, maybe. All right. Well, see, that's Tony Robbins style, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's Tony Robbins style. If you want to change your mind on something and you couldn't do it in any one of his group things, you yeah. pay $8,000, you fly, you then spend the money to fly to wherever he is, go to his castle, go up the turrets, you know, and then he stands there looming down at you going, you're here for what? <laughs> and um, apparently you change your mind on whatever you want fixed like instantly. <laughs> it just costs you all that money. But, I mean, that's how he changes your mind because if you've got that much guts to turn up, well, then clearly that is enough to understand that, well, I've got guts to change anything else. <laughs> I mean, I just went <laughs> to a giant's, you know, castle <laughs> and was stared at like down the, the, the spiral staircase of the turret. So, you know, um, so, yeah, so that being the case, it doesn't matter what price you pick. The secret behind delivering a price is not explaining it and being silent so that that person can un interpret what does that answer mean to me? Hang on, I think I've got a second question and just allow them to keep asking you questions. In the olden days, traditional sales training would teach the salesman ask really good questions so you can qualify the client and help them in the right direction. That was fantastic before Google because customers came out wanting to hear from a salesman, not talk to, but hear from a salesman. But now because of Google, customers have done all of their research, good research, the bad research, the right research, the wrong research. But the truth is, is we'll never truly guess what problem they're looking to solve. And when they've come to us, they've got gaps in their research on the problem they're looking to solve that our product or service might actually fix their problem. But we're not privy to their problem. We're not privy to all of their research. We now, if we listen, we'll hear where they've got a gap. How much does it cost for coaching, right? And, I mean, and that gap might not actually be the gap. I've looked at your website. I know exactly what your price is now. I'm just going to start with that. How much does it cost? Because in their head, you know, if they can't answer that question, if it doesn't line up with their website, well, they're a liar. I'm not going to them. 
<laughs> yeah, for test. So it's that <laughs> if you don't have a price on the website, it's like, seriously, like how much is it? But the person who doesn't have a price on the website is really pr often proves that they can't answer that question anyway. How much does it cost? Oh, we'll see, it all depends on what you want. No, it doesn't. It's got to start somewhere. There's got to be something in there. So they can't answer that question anyway. They got so confused by the question themselves. Gone, I'll just leave it up on my website. And then hope that they never ask and just buy it without ever asking. Who has a spend million dollars sitting in their back pocket? That well, they can interesting, up, Misty, because like, I, I was a bit not a fan of prices on website, but you've actually had me shift my mindset around that. And, and I think that there's, anyway, it's an experiment now to see if that actually works for us um because did you move it up to the top not yet but not i yet. do like the idea yeah i haven't moved yeah. it yet yeah so, um but thank you so much for sharing your wisdom uh what would be the type of people you would like to connect with you and recommend how they connect with you so um so i have a goal um with all my sales training my sales knowledge it's absolutely useless with me by the way i use it <laughs> And um, and so I, I have it, and so it's 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 nothing to me. So my goal is to share it out. Um, I have a goal to only help eight billion people on the planet currently. Help eight billion people on the planet. So the people I help are um uh, those who have something to sell. Mm. But if we were going to drill down, because everyone likes some sort of avatar, right? It doesn't matter what the product or service is. It all works exactly the same. It's really an exchange of cash for thing cash for service, cash for actual physical product. It makes no difference. Um, everything can be sold because it has been before. If I was going to drill down, I said the people I help really are those that um, are tired of not achieving the sales goal that they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And so now they might have read plenty of books on the sales train going, I know I can work it out. Honestly, you can't. The majority of people, more than 99 0.9% of people who have read a sales book have done any sort of sales training by themselves on the job or anything like that. 99% of people have sales anxiety, which will stop you from selling no matter how much sales training you've done. Sales anxiety is this. How much does it cost? Oh, what? Well, see, it kind of depends. If you get stuck on that how much does it cost question and you can't just make up any figure like on the spot or just give them any number on the spot, then that will stop you from selling. And so my job is to help everybody that has something to sell but is achieving the goal. It's, it's, it starts there. Once you can do that, most of the rest of the sales will sort itself out. And so here, if that is something you can practice at home, just practice it at home, understand people are going to have comments and thoughts and whatever on it. So always going to start with a negative reaction. That should be able to fix a lot of people. Those who feel that they need a little bit more help, I'm so easy to find. I am the only Misty Henkel in the planet. And the last name is oh. H-E-N for Nelly, K-E-L. And anything that you, you can Google it. I'm like Ryan Reynolds. You know, Ryan Reynolds doesn't have a website. And yet if you write Ryan Reynolds into Google, Google has all this cool stuff that it's accumulated on Ryan Reynolds. I'm a bit like that <laughs> now is I don't have a website, but if you write Misty Hankel or Misty Hankel sales trainer, Google's found like lots of cool stuff on me. And, um, and I wear a crown. So on Facebook, I'm the only Misty Hankel, but I have a crown. Um, and I'm just wondering, do I have something with uh, my picture on it? Uh, probably not. Um, yes, I'm wearing a crown. LinkedIn, I think I'm wearing a crown. So there's my picture for those who can see. But I'm wearing a crown and I'm the only one. So you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm a bit rubbish on LinkedIn. But, um, but yeah, otherwise, my email address, super easy, mistyhankel at gmail.com. And okay. so I can be found that way too. You can just write and say, I might need a hand or can I have a quick catch up? about this thing that I sell. I mean, you write that as a subject line. Can I have a catch up about this thing that I sell? And then nothing else. I'm going to call you back. <laughs> right. I'm so sure you will. So oh, that yeah. is perfect. Yeah. We also have all your details in the description of this um, chat as well. And um, thank you so much for having a chat with me. <laughs> So it's like <laughs> <So much> really fun. <laughs> always fun to chat with you. Um, and for those who are um, watching, thank you for being here. Feel free to like, comment, ask questions, all of that jazz. 
Uh, Misty, final thoughts for today. Enjoy yourself. The price isn't the problem. It's your delivery of the price. And so this thing that you sell, I'm sure is designed to help hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And it's always going to come at a cost. People know that they complain, we don't want to spend money, but we, we are actually prepared to spend. And the customer really wants to have an easy way to say, thank you for helping me out. To just exchange cash for help is so easy. The customer feels like they've rewarded you because they've been rewarded by you. So have fun with it. Enjoy that there will be comments made no matter what. And just enjoy the fact that your job is to help hundreds of thousands of people, might be just one at a time or in groups, but hundreds of thousands of people. And in that enjoyment, you'll find that actually it's quite easy to just say what you do with the price because someone's going to comment. And inside of all of those comments, it means someone's listening as well. So they have that opportunity to buy. If someone's listening and complaining, they're also listening and remembering. And so they can always, if they're not buying right now, they can come back. But if you make it really easy for them to get their words out, like Deb did. I know, right? It's crazy, isn't it? That's like the best comment ever. And then um, and then just let them think, what does that mean to me? I'm going to have to buy it anyway. Hook me up. Sign me up. <laughs> I wouldn't have been here calling otherwise. So have fun with this thing and the price. Just have fun with it. Love it. Love it. Have fun. And until next time, keep on loving. Thanks, Misty. <laughs> See you. Thanks. So good.